Hello, and welcome to Wizardry. Hello, everyone. Uh, thanks for tuning in. I'm assuming that from the thumbnail, you surmise that Demogorgon is the big beastie that I put on my train that I built on the last video. Uh, he was the biggest, meanest son of a gun in the Monster Manual when I first started playing. My friend Bill, aka Bilbin Gaming on Instagram, you should really check him out. Uh, he introduced me to Dungeons and Dragons, Tunnels and Trolls, Chainmail, and I was blown away by Demo Gun. Uh, the most horrifying thing you could come across in Dungeons and Dragons when I started playing in junior high was Demo Gorgon. Demo Gorgon first appeared in Eldritch Wizardry in 1976. He was a monstrously tall bipedal beast sporting two arms that split into two massive tentacles, twin simian heads resembling mandrel baboons each with its own personality and agenda, and stacked with spells and defenses that were truly horrifying, considering that characters back then were lucky to make it to fifth level. He was unstoppable, unmatchable, unbelievable. When it came time to pick a model, I'm not a huge fan of this sculpt. Uh, with it clinging to the rail like an old man with a walker, just didn't care for it. Uh, nor do I care for the often seen 80s Saturday morning cartoon color scheme that you often see. So I decided I'm going to paint it the wizardry way. I picked this model here. It's actually a pre-painted WizKids Dungeons and Dragons Icons of the Realm model. It's more of a Kenner action figure material than a typical like GW mini or a resin model. As far as the type of plastic that it's made out of. Of course, I had to futz with it a little first. It's what I do. I dremel out the fissures that are already sculpted into the body to further accentuate those. I wanted the appearance of his molten inner core or evil energy to be a bit more dramatic. And I knew that the way the dremel tool would chew up the plastic, it would end up more jagged and exaggerated as well as deeper to give me a little more to work with. Another change I wanted to make was to take that little Pomeranian curly crew out of his tail. I love this model because of the drama of it all. The heads are whipping around and gnashing and the way the tentacles are lashing about. It has so much action to it. So I wanted the tail to be more extended and flowing like the rest of the model. I grabbed the hair dryer and I got to work. It took a few attempts to get the memory out of it and to get it to hold, but I got it there. A lot of times when I do this, rather with hair dryer or boiling water, I alternate from heat to an ice water bath to set the change in the plastic. Before I could put any primer on this bad boy, I needed to do some cleanup to the areas that I had carved out with the Dremel tool. I also needed to do some pretty serious gap filling on this guy. I started by filling the deepest of the recesses with milliput before switching over to an epoxy sculpt milliput blend for the surface details and a minimal amount of sculpting on his mane. He had quite a lot of gaps to fill before priming. And when it came to priming, I used a rattle can to prime this guy. And I have a quick tip regarding prepping a rattle can before priming. If you have a dog, you may be familiar with this paw cleaner. We bought this for our dog Buck a while back. The inner sleeve with these silicone tendrils fits a rattle can great. Just fill it part way with warm water and it holds the can in place and upright as it warms up the rattle can evenly, giving you optimum performance from your primer. I have to say, I really like the look of this model with just the primer coat on it. Maybe it's just me or maybe just because it was Demo Gorgon. I thought it looked pretty darn cool but not cool enough that I wasn't thoroughly ready to start slapping some base coats on this guy and get him underway. I started off with this kind of bruised skin base coat to build his appearance from. My idea for his skin tone overall was to be a somewhat normal Caucasian skin with a bit of a hint of sickly yellow to it and then add some glazes of green tones later on that's kind of the best way I can describe the images in my mind at the time. I was trying to walk that line between mammal, 
reptile, and cephalopod, and that's not really a common theme I'm used to trying to portray. When painting this model, the need for perfectly smooth, clean brush strokes was a non-issue. His skin is heavily textured, not to mention the cracks and crevices. Um, it was nice just to be able to jab and stipple the paint on and not having to worry about unwanted texture and to some extent not even worrying over consistent coverage. That's not to say I didn't pay any attention to the direction of my brush strokes or to my application of my paint. As always, I was mindful of where and how I was depositing the paints while layering up and building my volumes. Although this would be more of a factor later on when I was glazing, for instance, I didn't neglect the fact of ending my brush strokes in the areas where I wanted the most pigment and get in an even coverage, but it's, the, it's that the model allowed me more freedom and variations than typical. I think the best thing about the process of painting this model was the fact that I wasn't restrained at all in how he needed to look. Overall, Demogorgon has remained the same through the years as far as his basic body structure as described in the Monster Manual, but his appearance has been interpreted in many ways and often vastly different depending on each artist's interpretation. So even though I had a general direction that I wanted to set off in, I could change course at any time. If I didn't like where the paint scheme was going, or if I had a better idea come to mind. Or, in this instance, when I'd forgotten to thin my speed paint 50% with medium, as a result of my error, I ended up darkening my paint job way more than I'd intended. But as Vince Venturella would say, that's okay. It's fine. It's just paint. I like that attitude. Speaking of like, if you like this video, give it a like. Subscribe if you'd like to be alerted when I drop my next video. Share with your hobby friends. And let me hear your comments and ideas. After my speed paint mishap, I decided to go in a slightly different direction. I chose khaki because of the greenish yellow hue which kept me aligned with the original skin tone concept, and it definitely has a sickly feel, as well as a reptilian feel to it. For the first application, I had mixed it with a touch of beastie brown. I then applied just straight khaki as I layered up from there. My little mistake had made me start over somewhat and rethink where I was heading, but I was feeling confident and satisfied with the altered approach. I abandoned the large brush that I had been using for maximum coverage. The layers were getting smaller as I worked towards my highlights, and so it dictated a smaller brush to give me more control on, on the torso. But on the tentacles and tail, I opted for a dry brush. I began my glazes with red to accomplish several things. One, it gives Demogorgon a somewhat human attribute by adding a pinkish tone to the skin. Two, it shows life, blood flowing through his monstrous physique. And three, it helped me establish my shadow areas, which were going to include the complementary color green. But before I moved on to that step, I first laid down a base of a heavy-bodied titanium white and all of the cracks that would eventually end up as his inner heat bursting through his skin. I then began to glaze in my green tones. Green was multi-purpose in its application as well. Uh, one obvious intention is that it is the complementary color to red, as I'd mentioned, but also it adds that foreign, evil, ick, unnatural factor to the skin which also ties in with the reptilian aspect. And green is often associated with sea creatures as well, such as cephalopods, although they tend not to be green. Regardless, there it is. Um, I eased into this glaze, applying it much slower than I did with the red, not wanting to overpower the torso with this tone. I wanted it to be visible, but subtle. Green was going to play a much bigger role in painting other parts of the model, and I didn't want the end product to look cartoonish. 
As a result, I started off painting the tentacles with very subtle tones, not wanting to stray too far from the skin tone. But as I progressed, I became more empowered or, or bold, I'm not sure. And I decided to amp up the vibrancy, going a lot further than I had originally intended. I kept my fingers crossed when applying this coat to the torso. I kept reminding myself that wet paint is brighter than dry paint. And the translucent nature of the paints I was using would allow the tones beneath to bleed through. I must admit though, I didn't have myself thoroughly convinced that I was heading in the right direction. But he was looking very demonish and it felt good to push myself beyond my comfort zone. After applying this wash to bind my layers together, much of my anxiety and apprehension was alleviated. I had rounded a blind corner and come out in pretty darn good shape in the end. So I cranked up the volume on the tentacles as well. Being encouraged by my successful decision to take some chances, and I learned a few things as well. It's these small victories, those moments of aha, or oh, I get it now, that make this hobby so gratifying to me. And in truth, that's what makes all the hard work that goes into making a video worth it. Sharing it with like-minded people. And maybe, just maybe, helping them get to one of those moments. You can't really ask for more than that. Sharing your passion with someone else is a reward in itself. Someone enjoying the result of your efforts, gaining wisdom or just enthusiasm from your efforts, be it a close friend or a stranger. It's just cool to me. That's what makes likes, shares, comments, subscribers, all of it such a special thing. We have an awesome community where we share, critique, learn, and support one another's efforts and accomplishments. I'm sure I'll never win a prestigious award for my painting or teach classes at a convention, but I can reach out from my basement and share my love of creation with anyone in the world that would like to tag along with me on my journey. Pretty damn awesome. And speaking of my journey, this video proved to be quite an adventure. The sheer size of this model was way larger than what I was used to filming. And the flailing tentacles that add so much character and movement to the model always seem to be in the way in one way or another. Being a newcomer to YouTube, I have already found staying in frame quite the challenge, especially when the paint is flowing smoothly and I've found my groove. And it seemed with this model, it was even more of a challenge when it came time to paint the faces. So I apologize that this part may seem lacking or incomplete as compared to the rest of the video. After laying down my base coats on his face, or faces, I turned to the volcanic eruptions happening throughout his torso. I had painted fluorescent yellow over the titanium white as I had also done on the inside of his mouths. I also mixed the fluorescent into my regular acrylics when painting the volcanic eruptions throughout his torso. With this being one of the main features, if not the main feature, of the model I really wanted it to pop. Sadly, I hadn't yet received my Procryl fluorescence in the mail but this hard bodied acrylic seemed to do the job well enough. To really sell the fact that he had this superheated core buried deep within him, I decided to accent the edges of the eruptions by stippling blackened burned rims. This, I think, really sold the idea. And by putting the singed rim around these areas, I was establishing a light to dark to light transition and it helped to make the molten features pop out even more. I knew from the moment that I ordered this model that when it came time to paint the faces, I was going all in on the mandrel aspect. The multicolored faces of these primates always seemed so haunting and surreal to me. 
and in combination with their piercing eyes and massive teeth, they just seemed like they would be a horror to encounter. The perfect face, or faces, for a demon. As I began, I was slightly apprehensive when it came time to start applying these bold colors onto his faces and mane. Even though this array of colors appears in nature on the actual creature, I wasn't sure how well I'd be able to translate it onto the model and not end up with a cartoonish or clownish end result. But with the results I'd obtained by pushing past my comfort zone and going for the flash of bright colors and the stark contrast of darker tones, I was actually feeling increasingly optimistic that, yeah, I can pull this off. I know this video has been rather lengthy and very wordy, but I hope you've enjoyed it. And if you've watched the entirety of the video, you are a true legend and I thank you sincerely. And here he is, Demo Gorgon, in all of his evil magnificence. I know I could have taken him much further, especially the tail, tentacles, and mane, but I am happy with my results, and I think he looks at home on his base, and he will look good on the shelf. I will be happy to display him, and who knows, maybe in the future I will take him a little bit further. I do know I had a blast painting him, and I hope you enjoyed watching my process, mistakes, changes, and successes. As always, thank you for watching. Like if you liked it, share with your friends, subscribe, let me hear your comments. I'll see you in the next video. Until then, make some magic happen. With that, I'm Wes, and this is Wizardry.